Hi. Welcome to Unit 4 for American Musical Theatre. In the late 1950s, the success of Broadway's My Fair Lady ushered in an era of adaptations of literary characters and historical personages. So in the 60s, we're going to see, for example, um, Charles Dickens's Oliver Twist being converted to a musical called Oliver. Musicals became bigger, more costly, uh, longer to recoup the investors' money, but because the risk was so worth it, blockbuster musicals became the goal for most investors. Another thing to think about is in the 1960s, socially there was so much going on in the United States. Social unrest um, and the Vietnam War, a lot of problems happening. Racial problems still, racism. So Except for a few isolated cases, Broadway really did not keep up with the culture of the time. It, it uh, had very few shows that dealt with any of these cultural concerns. And it was also slow to make changes with the music and dance of the time. So you'll recall from the past that uh, the social dances of the time always played a big part in dance and musicals as well as the musical styles such as ragtime, jazz. Um, but because of the rock and roll and the kind of dance styles of the 1960s, Broadway was slow to take up that cause. Finally, in 1968, a very groundbreaking musical called Hair emerged on the scene. And what Hair did was bring musical theater to that new level of rock music, um, social issues, it also ushered in an era of musical, musicals experimentation in directorial styles and artistic vision. We're going to find um, a lot of people taking off of the platform of um, book musicals instead of that now. We're going to find a lot of experimentation in what was called the concept musical. Basically, it came to fruition through the efforts of producer-director Harold Prince. And uh, he got together with different collaborators. The very first show that was a super success as being what we call a concept musical was Cabaret in the late 1960s. Cabaret was a show written by Kander and Ebb, who also are the collaborators um, and the creators of the show Chicago. But Cabaret was groundbreaking in that it had a metaphor, a physical metaphor on stage. There was a huge mirror that reflected the audience's image back to itself. And the metaphor was that the audience itself should, should see itself in the, the characters of the show Cabaret. Cabaret was based around a pre-Nazi Germany just when Hitler was rising to power and showed the indifference of the German people towards what was going on there. So the creators wanted the audience to kind of put themselves in the shoes of the characters. Um, Cabaret was also had a loose plot to it, which is another characteristic of concept musicals. Um, it was set in a style similar to Chicago in that there were a lot of little vaudeville cabaret acts one after the other in which a character was revealed. So that's another aspect of concept musicals, is the plot does not always go along and reveal the characters very neatly or tie up a story. Sometimes the plots in concept musicals are actually going to be going backwards in time or a lot of flashbacks. It's not just a linear progression like we're used to. Um, not to say that every musical in the 60s and 70s was a concept musical, but you can see it as a definite direction that experimentation was heading. A lot of these shows weren't that successful. Some of them were. So uh, one creator whose shows were not successful commercially but uh, was successful with the critics and actually now, um, has, now everybody loves his shows is Stephen Sondheim. You'll recall Stephen Sondheim wrote the lyrics to Gypsy for those of you that watch Gypsy. Um, he also wrote the lyrics to West Side Story and now he's going to be branching off on his own, writing both music and lyrics for a lot of shows. Uh, the first show that he and Harold Prince did together that was a concept musical is called Company. And your book goes into talking about Company. So that was a really important milestone. 
Sondheim also introduces musical theater to the context, the context of subtext. Subtext in lyrics or in dialogue in movies, you see it a lot, is just simply where the actor is saying or singing one thing, but the whole meaning he's not revealing through the words. There's things he's holding back. There's things deep inside his emotions that he's not giving the audience, not letting you know about it. It's very important in realistic acting, subtext is. Um, you see it a lot in movies because you can get close-ups and see things happening with the actor's face that maybe they say one thing but you can see in their face that, that they don't really mean that. So that was a new concept in musicals. Instead of somebody just jumping up and shouting to the world you know, how they're feeling and being true about it, the subtext becomes more important. So that means that while the styles in musicals are becoming less realistic as far as not you know, revealing a story uh, unraveling itself in linear time, you're seeing more actual realism in people, 3D characters, and uh, the way people act in real life a little bit more. Sondheim was also a risk taker. He didn't care if he was going to be uh, successful at the box office. He just wanted to keep going. He just wanted to keep creating. He believed in himself. And he cemented that in a very interesting musical called Sweeney Todd. A very dark musical based on an old tale of a, a barber in ancient London, not ancient, I'd say 1800s London, who would slit the throats of his victims as he got his clients into the chair. So uh, if you're interested in watching that, there's a great musical in, in 2006, I think it was, with Johnny Depp. It's really wonderful. Okay. Ah. However, in the 1970s, the show that brought in the most revenue and was the longest running and was the biggest blockbuster was actually the smallest show, A Chorus Line, in 1975. It, was, it ran for over 6,000 performances. A Chorus Line had a pop rock score. It was developed slowly in little workshops, which is now a new thing that is going to start happening more for Broadway shows. No scenery, just the backdrop of an empty stage, very little costuming, but big megabucks. So A Chorus Line was hard to beat. Um, in fact, the movie Chicago, uh, the show Chicago and Chorus Line were up for the same types of Academy of Tony Awards, and Chorus Line just hands down beat out Chicago for every award. Interesting. Another thing that happened in the 60s is that Broadway suffered, began to su suffer dramatic losses in people coming to see the shows in audience numbers because of how degraded Times Square and Broadway had become. The condition was horrible. You can read more about that in your book. But the mayor of, that, of the city at that time and other people launched campaigns to try to clean Broadway up, to clean up Times Square, and to begin attracting um, audience members once again. And that's when Disney gets on board and jumps in there and says, okay, let's think about if we can start bringing in some shows. And you'll begin to see that um, in the 1980s. But other family-friendly shows came back to Broadway, such as Annie. And so you'll see uh, a change there that Broadway's going to now move into a different direction. And that will happen through the 1970s. So have a good time this week looking at Unit 4, and I'll see you online.